This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, here in Lecture 14.5, we're going to deal with a relief that is now known, at least as from Finance Act 21, so it's the name that we use, as gift holdover relief. But that term there, holdover, is the new word that has come in. It's now known as gift holdover relief. In all years up until Finance Act 21, so up until our current year, therefore, it was quite simply known as gift relief. So in the lecture that you're going to see, which again uses Finance Act of 2019 lecture, why? Because there are no changes in the rules that are applied as regards the qualifying conditions and how the relief is applied. But one change we do have here is yet again one of terminology. It's a situation that we're used to from what we saw in the previous two lectures when dealing with rollover relief. Because as with those lectures, the previous two, references will be made to entrepreneur's relief, which we now, of course, know as business asset disposal relief. So not only have we had a complete name change, entrepreneur's relief has become business asset disposal relief, now from Finance Act 21, we've got a slight amendment to the name. What used to be purely gift relief is now known as gift holdover relief. And should you be required to use the term in the examination, it is that term that you will use. So it's now gift holdover relief rather than gift relief. There will be references in this particular lecture that deals with gift relief. There will be references to the uh, entrepreneur's relief as we had in the previous two lectures. Again, we have to now remember that that is business asset disposal relief. And also in this lecture, we'll be moving on from gift relief, potentially then through business asset disposal relief, and then down to the calculation of a taxable gain. And that taxable gain, of course, is after deducting AEA. Now, given that the lecture you're about to see is from Finance Act 2019, as with previous situations where we've dealt with this particular issue, they use, it will be using, I will be using back then in my Finance Act 2019 days, an AEA of 12,000. You, of course, will be working through the examples uh, that are within this part of the chapter. The examples shown in your study notes You'll be working from Finance Act 21, 2021. You'll be using your study notes. The rules haven't changed, but when I go through both the class examples and also the examples from the study notes, then where we're using an AEA, it will be done for 1920 tax year, and that will be 12,000. We will simply use 12,300 pounds. So we've got a couple of terminology changes, as I've said. We now put the word holdover between the words gift and relief. As before, we're now talking about business asset disposal relief instead of entrepreneur's relief. And we're also talking about an AEA of 12,000. Now, in terms of your study notes, section 4.2 is where we bring in the term of business asset disposal relief and see the interaction between gift relief and business asset disposal relief. But in the lectures, of course, that is going to refer to ER, or Entrepreneur's Relief, as it was. In terms of our examples, again, we're going to see references as regards. Again, that will be eligible still post-gift relief, but eligible for business asset disposal relief. And then the deduction of what is now an AEA of 12,300, but as I've just said, was back in the 1920 tax year, that was £12,000. And the same will happen in example 10, a reference to business asset disposal relief. The lecture will show it and I will say it as entrepreneur's relief. And there we'll also see an AEA, not of the current level of 12.3, which you will use, but of £12,000. Other than that, as I say, there are no changes whatsoever in the rules. So, over to me then for the Finance Act 2019 lecture on gift relief, or as we'll now know it, gift holdover relief.
In this lecture, we now turn our attention to gift relief. And just as with the two lectures before it on rollover relief, it will allow a gain that qualifies for this relief to be deferred. The manner of the deferral you will see in the forthcoming lecture. And that forthcoming lecture is again going to be the one that was produced based on the Finance Act of 2019. Because with this relief, like with rollover, there have been no technical changes whatsoever in the way in which the rule works and the way in which that is applied. What we do have, of course, is an interaction with, possible interaction indeed, with the availability of business asset disposal relief. So given that it's Finance Act 2019, it's exactly the same issue as we dealt with when looking at the Finance Act 19 lectures for rollover relief. That is that the reference in the lecture is to entrepreneurs relief, whereas now we have it as business asset disposal relief. And that's going to be seen both within the notes themselves that we'll look at now, where in section 4.2 after the introduction to gift relief telling you the basically how it works and the circumstances in which it would be available. We talk here, as I say in section 4.2, about an interaction with business asset disposal relief. Really. In the lecture, it'll be an interaction with entrepreneurs relief, really. but it's exactly the same. It's the same situation as we saw with rollover. The rollover relief and now gift relief allows a gain to be deferred. Business asset disposal relief is a lower tax rate that is applied to a taxable gain. So if you choose to make a claim for rollover relief or for gift relief, then those reliefs will apply before ever you get to the application of business asset disposal relief. When you have dealt with the deferral of the gain, if all of the gain is deferred, there's nothing to be taxed. So there's no issue about whether you call it entrepreneur's relief as once we did or now as we do business asset disposal relief. It is only if some amount of the gain that arose was unable to be deferred for whatever reason. We've seen it with rollover. You're about to see it with gift relief then would that remaining gain that would otherwise be taxable, can that benefit from business asset disposal relief and have that lower tax rate? Well, that's what we see here, as I say, in terms of this note. And the only difference to last year is that the reference here is to business asset disposal relief rather than entrepreneurs relief. And as we said, it comes first. If you choose to defer again, then it isn't going to be taxable and therefore business asset disposal relief is not an issue. As well as that reference in the notes, there's also situations in terms of your answers to examples, where again we have after dealing with, I won't spoil this for you by going through the this particular answer, but just pointing out that here we have post gift relief a revised gain eligible for business asset disposal relief. In the lecture, again, as you see on the screen, that will read entrepreneur's relief. Now, again, you will use these Finance Act 2020 notes. There's no need to try to follow what is on the screen in terms of the notes. You're going to use these notes. It's exactly the same apart from this wording is different. Now we call it business asset disposal. The other issue that we have is when asked to compute a taxable gain, that means the deduction of AEA. And of course, for us now in the 2021 tax year, that AEA available is, as you see there, and as you well know, £12,300. Well, back in Finance Act 2019, hence in the lecture that you see and what will come up on screen, that figure will be 12000 We will be using, of course, for our exam, the up-to-date 2021 AEA, as you see here, 12,300. And that repeats itself also in terms of example 10, where again, we've got the issue about its business asset disposal relief, not entrepreneur's relief. And we've got the AEA for 2021 tax year rather than the 1920 tax year. So these points of differences between what you see in the lecture 
and what you need to know for our exam for this particular year. We've got the FA219 reference in the study notes and in our answers to examples 9 and 10, to Entrepreneur's Relief, which indeed we may call ER during that lecture, which is now replaced, as we know, by Business Asset Disposal Relief. In those answers to those examples, as we've just pointed out, then in the FA19 answer, you see an AEA of £12,000, which was, the, again, the correct figure for 1920 tax year. But now, in your 2020 Finance Act 2020 notes, it is, of course, 12300 applied for our 2020-21 tax year. Other than that, everything you need to know about the qualifying conditions, so where gift relief will be available, how it works in all the circumstances in which it could be applied, all of that remains the same. So all that remains for you to do now is to go through that particular lecture and find out what you need to know to answer any question dealing with gift relief. Well, as we introduce this subject at the end of the previous session together, we are recognising now that the second of two deferral reliefs that are within your syllabus, the first of which was rollover relief, of course, there, we now come to the second of these two, gift relief. Let's remind ourselves about what we said at the end of that previous session. We know that a gift will still represent a chargeable disposal. And if the asset is a chargeable asset, which of course in the exam it will be, then it will be subject to capital gains tax. The donor, i.e. the person making the gift, is treated as making a disposal of the asset at market value. So again, as well we should know by now, if you gift an asset away, the gift is a chargeable disposal. If the asset is a chargeable asset, then the donor, the person making the gift, will still have to compute again based on the market value of that asset at the date of the gift. What happens, therefore, to the donee? We haven't considered the donee previously. The donee, i.e. the person receiving the gift, is then treated as if they had acquired the asset at market value. At market value. So if we had a situation where, in relation to a gift made from the donor to the donee, that the market value of that, all of this say in, th in thousands of pounds, that the market value of the asset in question was £300,000 and its cost was £200,000, then there would be a gain of £100,000. Without any gift relief claim, the base cost to the donee would be equal to its market value. What was the market value? £300,000 there, therefore. So, in the situation of a gift, we compute again on the donor based on market value, irrespective of any actual sales proceeds that may or may not exist, whether it was an outright gift or a sale at undervalue, irrespective of any actual proceeds, it's based on market value. So the donor is then responsible for that gain, even though they've received maybe little or no actual proceeds. And the donee is sitting pretty here. This donee, he or she, has received an asset worth £300,000. They've received it for nothing. It was a gift to them. And going forward, their base cost will still be deemed to be the 300,000, the full market value. Now you can see who's losing out on this. This, of course, is the donor. So what happens when gift relief is claimed? The donor's gain is deferred. So gift relief would be claimed to defer that 100,000 pound gain. And what's gonna happen is that the deferral doesn't simply delay the point in time when the gain will crystallise. It will now be deferred until some future point. But also the person responsible for that gain in the future has changed because that person will now be the donee. 
where as you can see with this simple exercise here, the gain of 100, that is the gain deferred. We deduct that in establishing the base cost to the donee. So the donee's base cost has now become £200,000. If they for they went out the next day, the next year, or wherever in the future, and were to sell that for, say, £300,000, they would have a cost of two hundred. pounds Deduct from their proceeds of three hundred. pounds It is they, the donee, who would then end up being responsible for that gain. And that's got to be seen as a pretty sensible basis of dealing with this that the person who is benefiting from this gift is clearly the donee without gift relief we are further dare i say punishing not a word to use in the exam by the way the donor by not only saying yep you're now worse off by three hundred thousand you've given this asset away but we're still going to calculate a gain based on the market value and that's a hundred thousand pounds and charge that to tax at whatever is the, the relevant taxable rate there. In this way, we put the responsibility for that gain and therefore any future tax charge in relation to it on the donor. They're the person who benefited. OK, the situation, however, is that just because you make a gift, that does not qualify that gift for gift relief. As we've seen at a heading here, relief for the gift of business assets. So as it's been up until now, with entrepreneurs relief, there were qualifying business assets. With rollover relief, there were qualifying business assets. And so too, it will be with gift relief. We are talking about qualifying business assets. And of course, it wouldn't be tax without yet another silly rule, where although the qualifying business assets look mostly the same in all of these reliefs. There are certain differences that you need to be familiar with. So you will need to carefully learn what these qualifying business assets are for each of the various reliefs, including this one that we're about to see. Just moving down, therefore, and we'll look at what those qualifying assets are. Now, again, we're going to be talking about qualifying business assets here in section 4.4. Gift relief may be claimed on the gift of the following assets. Pretty obviously, if you're an unincorporated trader, assets used in the trade of the donor, i.e. where he's a sole trader. You could be a partner in a partnership, but basically a sole trader there. Assets used in the trade of the donor. Or you own certain business assets personally, but you don't run an unincorporated trade. Instead, what you have is share ownership. That asset, often a property, is used by a company in which you are a shareholder. Now, if your shareholding is sufficient, then the asset when you, remember, you personally own that asset, the property used in the company in which you are a shareholder, when you sell that property, even though it's been used by the company in its trade, not by you in any trade that you personally run, as long as the shareholding is sufficiently large, and as you'll see in a moment, it isn't very large to be sufficiently large, then gift relief claim will be available to you on that sale. So the donor in terms of a sole trader and then the donor's personal company. This extends the relief, as we were just saying, to assets owned by the individual, but not used by him or her directly for trading purposes. Instead, those assets are used in the individual's personal and it must be a trading company trading purposes now the definition that we have here a company qualifies as an individual's personal company if at least 
95% of the voting rights are owned by the individual. Now, again, you can see 5%, it's not very much. But if you've got 5%, it's said to be your personal company. If it is a personal trading company, again, these assets must be used in the trade. Again, looking here, assets used in the trade of the donor's personal company. You personally own the property that is then used by a company, a trading company, in which you own at least a 5% shareholding. It's your personal trading company. Of course, it may be a much more simple relationship between you and the company. You own simply the shares in the company and the company, of course, owns the assets and the trade. So if we have shares and securities of trading companies, provided that one of the following conditions apply. If they're unquoted shares, shares in an unquoted trading company, then whatever level of shareholding you have, those shares, when gifted, or any of those shares that are gifted, will qualify for gift relief. Shares or securities are not quoted on a recognised stock exchange. So if they're shares in an unquoted trading company, whether you own, and I use these numbers advisedly, 4%, or 5% or more, any level of shareholding in an unquoted trading company will rank for gift relief. If it's not unquoted, but it's a quoted trading company, then gift relief would still be available, but only if we're talking about shares or securities gifted are those of the individual's personal company. Now remember, personal was you own at least 5% of the voting rights. So if I own 4% of the shares in an unquoted trading company, and I give some or all of those shares away, that any gain arising is eligible for gift relief. It didn't matter that I only had 4% because they were shares in an unquoted trading company. If I owned 4% of the shares in a quoted trading company, then 4% is not 5%. It is not my personal trading company. Therefore, any such gift will not qualify for gift relief. If I own 5%, 6%, anything from 5% upwards, then that gain, just like with the gain on the shares in the unquoted trading company, then own 5% of a quoted trading company, then yes, gift relief would be available to you. So we need to know, therefore, the particular qualifying business assets for gift relief to be available. Now then, the availability of the relief, only available to individuals, not companies. Companies aren't going to go around giving things away. Of all the reliefs that we see in this chapter, we've had entrepreneurs relief, rollover relief. Now we're dealing with gift relief. We'll then go on in the final one to look at principal private residence relief. Only one of those reliefs is actually eligible for a company with incorporation tax, which we'll see later in our notes, by the way, in a later chapter. And that particular relief is the one we looked at in our previous couple of lectures, rollover relief. Companies, indeed, will be disposing of properties and replacing with other properties. Companies like unincorporated traders will be eligible for rollover, but none of the other reliefs. All of the other reliefs, entrepreneurs relief, this one gift relief, the next one principal private residence relief, they're all relevant just to individuals, not to companies. Obviously, with reliefs, there's a time limit. You're not going to worry about learning that now, but maybe closer to the day. Claim must be made by both the donor and donee. So it is a joint claim to be made by donor and donee and must be made within four years from the end of the tax year in which the disposal occurred. So if we make a gift, as may be the case in 2019-20, the claim must be made by the 5th of April 2024, four years on from the end of the tax year. 
the tax year 1920 ended as well, you know, on the 5th of April 2020. So you've got to make the claim, this joint claim, donor and donee, by the 5th of April 2024. In terms of interaction with entrepreneurs relief, then this one comes first. If you are choosing to defer a gain, it does not become chargeable. Entrepreneurs relief is a tax rate. It is only applicable to those gains that have not been deferred or exempted, those gains that still remain taxable in relation to your tax year. So when a claim for gift relief is made, the donor may lose entitlement to entrepreneur's relief in relation to that asset. We've deferred the gain. The responsibility for the gain has gone to the donee. When the donee disposes of that asset in the future, down to see whether they qualify for entrepreneur's relief. If the asset qualifies, then gift relief is claimed and it's applied before entrepreneur's relief. Entrepreneur's relief, or indeed now investor's relief, what was the last of the reliefs for you to see? Because their tax rates are that uh, lower 10% tax rate. Okay. Um, I gave you a little example earlier. There's a little example that should take you about 30 seconds to deal with. Have a go at that now, please. Okay, hopefully, therefore, a very straightforward exercise. Example eight, whereby David had bought an asset for £60,000 in June 17. In September 20, he gifted it to Tommy when its market value was 100000 the asset qualified for gift relief. Now, obviously, in the exam question, they'll tell you what the asset is. You will have to determine whether that asset does indeed qualify for gift relief. This one does, so it's just the mechanics of gift relief that we need to be able to deal with, because assuming that David and Tommy make a claim for gift relief, remember, it's a joint claim for gift relief that needs to be made, calculate Tommy's base cost of the asset. So what do we know? We know that on a gift, do we compute a gain based on market value? The market value was 100,000, the allowable cost 60, the gain was 40,000 pounds. If it is a qualifying asset for gift relief and the gift relief claim is made, that gain will be deferred. So David therefore will have no gain chargeable arising on that disposal. The entire 40,000 pound gain will be deferred. And what will do we defer it against? Tommy is the donee, they would have received it at, they, Tommy would have received it at a market value of £100,000, but that £100,000 is then of course reduced by the gift relief, the gift relief of £40,000, hundred minus forty takes us back to £60,000. You can see effectively what has happened there, effectively Tommy has taken what was David's base cost of £60,000 thus making Tommy responsible for any future gain made on the future disposal of that asset. They are the ones who will be responsible. OK. What we often get in exam questions to make them more, mm, what's the word, interesting there, is not an outright gift, but a sale at under value. We've actually got some proceeds. The situation where a taxpayer, they're usually making a gift to um, someone within the family, usually a son or daughter there. And when they make that gift, we know that um, it can be an outright gift or it could be a sale at under value, as we see with this note here. It may be the situation where the taxpayer may love to be able to make that outright gift, but can't afford to. It's a valuable asset. It's usually, as it has to be, of course, a qualifying business asset here. So what the donor might do in terms of this is often passing on the family business from one generation to another here is they sell it at undervalue. So it might be worth a million, but we sell it to them for 500,000. The donor's got 500,000 to keep him, her, then or them in uh, good health, we hope, or good wealth, I should say, there for the remainder of the days. But the son or daughter hasn't had to pay out the full value of one million. They've got it for half a million. Everybody's happy. OK, so what happens then if it's not an outright gift? 
how do we deal with that for purposes of CGT? Well, what we've always said, whether it's outright gift or sale at under value, you always compute the gain based on the market value at the date of gift. So gift relief is also available for sales made below market value where there's an element of gift. We know that the gain itself is based on market value. You do not use the actual sale proceeds in computing the gain. The gain, as we learnt in our first lecture in Chapter 12, is based on open market value wherever any element of gift is involved. So if we're ignoring actual proceeds in computing the gain, where does the actual proceeds come into play to make this exercise a bit more interesting? And what it impacts on is the availability of gift relief. The bigger the sales proceeds, then the less the amount of gift that you're actually making. And that therefore may serve to limit the amount of gift relief available. So how do we know when the actual proceeds become sufficiently big to say to the donor, ah, yeah, gift relief is available, but we're not now going to allow you to defer all of that gain. You've taken cash, albeit less cash than the full market value, but you've taken enough cash. There is a point at which you've taken enough cash to say, above that point, you the donor, on any proceeds in excess of that point, you will be responsible for that amount of the overall gain. Where is that point? Any actual proceeds received in excess of the original cost are chargeable to CGT immediately. If you've actually sold for more than cost, you've actually made a gain. That amount of any overall gain is therefore going to remain chargeable on the donor. It will not be eligible for gift relief. You cannot defer that part of the gain where you have actually made that gain. Now to illustrate, let's just have a little look at an example. The more basic one to begin with, taxpayer gifted a 20% shareholding in an unquoted trading company. So is this a qualifying business asset? Yes, it is. Shares, any shareholding in an unquoted trading company is going to be eligible for gift relief. What about here if I'd said that it was a quoted trading company? Then yes, we would still qualify in relation to gift relief. Why? Because 20% is at least 5% and therefore it's the taxpayer's, what was the expression? Personal trading company. So there, whether those shares, it being a trading company, whether it was unquoted or quoted, wouldn't matter, gift relief would be available. So he's gifted the 20% shareholding to his daughter. The shares had originally cost 100,000 and had an open market value of 250,000 at the date of the gift. So where that's an outright gift, we use the open market value, 250,000 in computing the gain. It's a simple exercise. Market value 250, cost 100, a gain therefore of 150,000 pounds. Now then, if no gift relief claim were made, the donor would have a gain of 250 minus 100, 150,000 pounds. And with no gift relief being claimed, the donee's base cost is simply equal to the market value of those shares at the date of gift, i.e. £250,000. That would be their cost. If as is more likely, of course, a gift relief claim is made, then the gain of £150,000 for the taxpayer is deferred, it is deferred by deducting it from the base cost to the donee, the daughter in this example. So her cost would have been, we've kept underlining that figure, so let's just do it again. Her cost would have been 250, but now less the deferred gain, the gain is 150,000. 
that would bring the daughter's base cost down to £100,000. Again, not surprisingly, an amount equal to the taxpayer's cost, leaving the daughter responsible for any future gains made on the subsequent disposal of those shares. But what we're talking about here is now that the taxpayer sold the shares to his daughter for half the open market value for half the open market value. Right, remember, irrespective of any actual proceeds, we compute a gain based on the open market value. The open market value of those shares, 250,000. Less the cost, 100. As we've already said several times, the gain arising, therefore, is 150,000 pounds. The question then arises, if they choose to make a claim for gift relief, taxpayer and daughter, then gift relief is available because these shares, as we've just said, are qualifying business assets for this purpose. But the problem is, it wasn't an outright gift. There was some actual proceeds. So there may still remain a chargeable gain on the donor after the gift relief claim has been made. So what did we do? It was a bit like with the situation of partial rollover, whereby what we did was to work out how much of the gain remained chargeable and then the rollover was a balancing figure. So it is here we work out the amount of the gain that remains chargeable. Now look back at what the note said. It says, any proceeds received in excess of the original cost. That amount is chargeable to CGT immediately. So we do a calculation here where we look at actual proceeds minus, of course, the actual cost. Now the sale was for half that market value of £250,000. So the actual proceeds, 125000 minus the actual cost, £100,000. Therefore, actual proceeds have exceeded actual cost, so £25,000 of the £150,000 gain remains chargeable. That remains chargeable. So if 25 out of 150 remains chargeable, the gift relief, like with rollover relief before it, where it was partial rollover, is simply a balancing figure. And that figure must be £125,000. What happens with that gift relief? For the donor, as you can see there, it's reduced what would have been a gain of 150 down to a mere £25,000. For the donee, the daughter here, it means that her base cost would have been the open market value of the shares, 250000 but that is reduced, of course, by what? As ever, by the gift relief. That's 125, which leaves the daughter with a base cost of 125000 for purposes of any future disposal made by her. So there we go, we've got the mechanics now of how to deal with a sale at under value. Calculate the gain based always on open market value and then work out how much of that gain, if any, remains chargeable. If actual proceeds, as they do here, exceed actual cost, then that amount of the gain remains chargeable. If here the actual proceeds have been £100,000 or less, then none of, the, none of the gain that has arisen would be still chargeable on the donor, and all of the gain would have been eligible for deferral through a gift relief claim. So if we'd actually sold for 100, 100 minus 100 is zero. If we'd sold for less than 100, whatever that is, minus 100 is still zero. No amount of gain would be chargeable on the donor, and all of the deferred gain, sorry, all of the gain would then be deferred if a gift relief claim were made. Now then, 
In this situation, as we've got it, £25,000 of the gain remained chargeable. Now, remember what we were dealing with. This were, these were shares in an unquoted trading company. So we've deferred what we could, £125,000. It's left chargeable, 25000 What the question may have asked you to do is then to go on and not just calculate the chargeable gain on the donor and or the base cost to the donor, but to actually for the donor compute the CGT liability. Now let's imagine that this was the only disposal, you'd have to be told this, this was the only disposal made in that tax year by the individual. Then of course though the chargeable gain is 25,000, that's not the taxable gain. What would you be able to do? You would reduce as you always reduce any chargeable, any net chargeable gains of the tax year by the AEA of the tax year. That being for us for the 1920 tax year, anyway, £12,000. So that would bring you down to 25 minus 12 would be a taxable gain of 13,000. We then need to see what tax rate to apply. Inevitably, you'll be told that the individual is a higher rate taxpayer, or the question gives you a taxable income for the taxpayer, which shows you that they are a higher rate taxpayer. So the question then is, what tax rate? Now we've got to look at the type of asset being sold and see whether any other relief may now be available. And the question here would be in terms of do we get either entrepreneurs relief or do we get investors relief? The most likely one for us to be dealing with would indeed be entrepreneurs relief. Now, when we look at the information provided we were told gifted a 20% shareholding in an unquoted trading company. 20% shareholding. Now, if you need to at this point, go back and remind yourself of the qualifying conditions for entrepreneur's relief. Those conditions were, we had to have at least a 5% shareholding. Well, we know that we have here, we're gifting a 20% shareholding. We don't know what we're gifting it out of, but certainly it is at least 5%. So on that basis, we've got enough shares. But you don't then still get entrepreneur's relief unless you have held those shares and been an employee in this company, this unquoted trading company, for at least two years, a 24-month period of ownership of the shares and employment within the company, either part-time or full-time, you may recall there, would be required. So if entrepreneur's relief was available, then of course the taxable gain would be taxed at 10%. Now again, you need to know when you bought, when you sold, to see do you have the two years, you need to be told whether or not we've an employee. Now, if of course, they give you further information that you're not an employee. So we're not an employee. You can't have entrepreneur's relief, but maybe this shareholding would benefit from investor's relief. So you couldn't be an employee for this particular purpose. But then, of course, you've got to look at the date when the shares were acquired, when the shares are sold to see that you have bought them after a particular date and you've held them for the requisite three years. In either case, a 10% tax rate, either for entrepreneur's relief or for investor's relief would apply, in which case 10% would apply. If you didn't qualify for either entrepreneur's relief or investor's relief, you're a higher rate taxpayer, therefore the tax rate would be 20%. So if a question, asks you not just to compute the amount of gift relief or the amount of uh, base cost, the deemed cost of these shares to the donee, but actually asks you to compute a CGT liability on the donor, assuming that all available reliefs are claimed, 
we would firstly deal with gift relief to defer as much of the gain as possible. Any amount of gain that remained chargeable, question then what tax rate is applicable. As a higher rate taxpayer, it should be 20%. What would make it less than 20, i.e. 10%, if the shares in question ranked for either entrepreneur's relief or investor's relief, giving us therefore a 10% tax rate accordingly. Okay, so some other things to contemplate there and to consider. Let's just go back to our notes now. And there you go, you have example nine to have a go at. So have a go at example nine. What we've got to do, what is the chargeable gain, if any, incurred by Richard? And what is the base cost of the shares for Richard's son? Again, it's going to be a gift of shares in an unquoted trading company. So you have a go at that, then we'll have a quick review and then continue on with our study here of gift relief. OK, let's see how we fared with this example, Richard example nine here. Again, remember two parts, calculate the gain based on market value, that gain £140,000. The question is how much of that gain is going to be eligible for gift relief? The bit that won't be eligible for gift relief is the amount by which the actual proceeds received exceed the actual cost. Well, we know the cost from this calculation here is 60,000. The actual proceeds you're told are 85. So 25,000 pounds of the 140,000 gain remain chargeable. So the revised gain here, albeit eligible for ER, this was not a part of the uh, question as set. But the revised, the chargeable gain, so far as Richard concerned, would be £25,000. The rollover relief is effectively therefore a balancing figure. We're going to charge 25000 out of 140, so 115000 is the balancing figure. It is, of course, the capital gain, 140, less the amount of that gain that remains chargeable. You don't necessarily need that working. All you had to do here was to put, as we did before, actual proceeds minus actual cost, that equals 25,000. What then is the balancing figure to go in there? 115,000. Once you know the gift relief, then you're able to work out the base cost to the donee. They would have gone, the shares would have gone to the donee at market value, less the gain deferred, the gift relief here, and that gives you the revised base cost, some £85,000. Again, not an odd number there. It is, of course, a figure equal to the actual amount paid by Richard's son for those shares. OK, so compute the gain based on market value. Establish then whether any of that gain remains chargeable, having, of course, firstly determined that gift relief is available. Is it a qualifying business asset for purposes of gift relief? If it is, then do we get full gift relief? No, we don't if actual proceeds exceed actual cost. That bit remains chargeable and only the balance may be deferred through uh, gift relief. What this example also did was to go on with the point that I was discussing before you had a go at this example. And that was that if we were asked to calculate the CGT, then we would need to know what was the taxable gain, not just the chargeable gain, and then the tax rate applicable to it. So if this is the only gain made by the taxpayer in the tax year, then the AEA would of course now be available and would be deducted £12,000 in bringing you down to the taxable gain. That taxable gain of 13,000, what tax rate would then apply? Again, in a question to be told, of course, or given the figure of taxable income, that our hero was a higher rate taxpayer. Now, that would normally imply a 20% rate of tax in relation to shares, but not here if they are eligible for entrepreneurs' relief. So we needed to go back to the question, back to the question here, where are we? and establish that entrepreneur's relief was available. Acquired a 25% holding in an unquoted trading company back in March 2005. 
immediately became an employee of the company. Now, there's nothing which says we stopped being an employee. So, do we have a 5% shareholding? Yes, we do. Are we an employee? Yes, we are. Have we been those things for at least two years? Yes, we have. And therefore, entrepreneur's relief would be available. And that basis, therefore, it is CGT at 10%. Entrepreneur's relief is indeed available. So again, read the questions requirement very carefully indeed. What are they actually asking for? Is it simply a chargeable gain after gift relief has been applied, where that gift relief may indeed be limited because it was a sale at under value, where the actual proceeds exceeded the actual cost? Do they just want that gain? Do they want the taxable gain? That, of course, would be after any available AEA, AEA had been deducted. Or do they want, as would then be the case here, the CGT liability, where you needed to know whether as here, entrepreneur's relief or in other circumstances, the possibility of investor's relief would have been available to change for a higher rate taxpayer, the CGT rate from what should have been 20% down to 10%. Okay. One final issue to deal with now, and that is same problem as we had when looking at rollover relief, and that is if the asset in question, not all of it is said to be a business asset to be used within the trade. So assets not wholly used for trading purposes, where only part of an asset is used for trading purposes, or an asset has been used for only part of the donor's period of ownership, then gift relief is restricted, again on a proportionate basis. The most likely situation, however, you're going to see, rather than there the unincorporated trader giving away the assets of the trade, is actually a gift of shares. And where the gift is shares, and the individual owns at least 5% of the voting rights. So for this restriction in the gift relief to apply, it only applies where you own at least 5% of the voting rights, i.e. it is your personal company. Then the capital gain on the shares eligible for relief is restricted by the following fraction. And this will come to know and love as CBA over CA, where CBA stands for the chargeable business assets of the company, and CA stands for all of the chargeable assets, which is both the top line, the chargeable business assets, CBAs, plus any investments. And what we can see now is if there are investments held on the balance sheet, the statement of financial position of this particular company, then we're not going to be entitled to full gift relief. Only the business proportion there. And this business proportion is taken as being the market value of the chargeable business assets over the market value of the chargeable assets. So we're not looking at all of the assets of the company. We are purely looking at those chargeable to CGT, chargeable assets. We'll remind ourselves of those in a moment's time. This treatment is completely different to that which applies for entrepreneur's relief. Remember, with entrepreneur's relief, either it's a trading company, in which case the gain is fully eligible for the 10% rate, subject to the lifetime limit of £10 million, or it isn't a trading company, in which case there's no ER. Remember, for entrepreneur's relief purposes, no question of apportionment. A company is either a trading company and therefore qualifies for ER, or it is not and it doesn't qualify. What are these chargeable assets and chargeable business assets? Now, an asset cannot be a chargeable asset where any profit that might arise on its disposal would not be a chargeable gain. This provision therefore rules out current assets such as inventory, 
when you dispose of inventory, that's a trading asset. So any disposal at above or below cost is a trading profit or trading loss. It's a trading asset. It's not a capital asset there. So that's out. Receivables, clearly, therefore, also not going to be a chargeable asset. And exempt assets, such as the other current asset, as it were, uh, cash. Motor cars are exempt assets, exempt chattels, items of plant and machinery that were both bought and sold for less than £6,000. Those are going to be exempt chattels. Any other plants and machinery not covered by the chattel exemption, then yes, they would be chargeable assets. Plant and machinery used within the trade, that would be a chargeable business asset. Chargeable business assets, those chargeable assets which are used for the purposes of a company's trade. Now, we've already said there that we'd be dealing with like stuff like plant and machinery, of course, if it is not covered by the £6,000 chattel exemption. Properties used within the trade is a fairly obvious chargeable business asset. It would also include, it's not likely to be tested, but goodwill purchased before the 1st of April 2 but it would exclude shares, securities and other assets held as investments. They are chargeable assets, but they're not chargeable business assets. So, we've established that we're dealing with shares in a company where gift relief is available. If we are talking about a shareholding held at least 5% of the voting rights, such that it is your personal company, then if there are non-trading assets on the balance sheet of the company at the point of the share disposal, then that is going to limit the amount of gift relief that is available, the amount of gain that is eligible for gift relief. The amount of gain that is eligible will be the gain times CBA over CA. Only one way to see whether we've understood this, and that, of course, is to work a little example. Calculate John's capital gains tax. So all the way to the bottom of this exercise, we've got to compute CGT on the disposal of shares in John Limited. And what then are the base cost of the shares for his son? John owns 100% of the shares in John Limited, of which he's the managing director. So 100% shares and an employee is the MD. On the 1st of December 19, he made a gift of the shares to his son when the market value of the shares was £800,000. Those shares had originally cost 200000 back in February 2001. At the time of the gift, John Limited owned the following assets. OK, so what do we know? We know that freehold trading prof uh, premises there will be a chargeable business asset. We know that investments will simply be a chargeable asset. They're not business assets used in the trade, but they're chargeable assets there. Stocks and work in progress, debtors, cash, none of those are chargeable assets at all. And then we've got this one, goodwill. The note that we just read, including goodwill purchased before the 1st of April 02. And what we're told here is the shares cost 200,000 in February 2001. So this company predates the 1st of April 02, in which case, therefore, the goodwill is said to be a capital asset. So that, and obviously goodwill, the value of the trade, that is clearly a business asset, that is a chargeable business asset. So in terms of our calculation of CBA over CA, we now know that the chargeable business assets, the freehold trading premises and the goodwill, 700,000, over the total chargeable assets, i.e. CBA plus investments, 700,000 plus 100, that's 800,000. And that will be applied to the gain to establish the amount of that gain 
that is therefore eligible for gift relief. The gain itself should be a straightforward exercise. The shares were valued at £800,000 and they had cost £200,000. So a simple enough gain. Remember what we had to do was to compute John's CGT. We now know that only 700 over, eight, oh, 700 over 800, so 7 eighths of that gain of 600 will qualify for gift relief. That will still leave some of that gain chargeable. The question therefore is whether or not that remaining gain qualifies for entrepreneur's relief and therefore would benefit from a 10% tax rate. Over to you therefore, just to finish that off quickly and then we'll review very quickly at the end of your attempt at this question and that will bring this uh, long session to an end. Okay, hopefully therefore, we're looking at the numbers that you can see here on the screen. We know the market value 800, the cost 200, so there's your chargeable gain of 600. The big question was how much of that overall gain would be eligible for a gift relief claim. We have already worked out, looking at the balance sheet of the company, that we have chargeable business assets of £700,000 over total chargeable assets, the business assets plus the investments of £800,000. That therefore applied to £600,000 of gain equals £525,000. So, if of course the gift relief claim is made, we can't defer, John can't defer here, all of the 600 gain, only 525. That therefore will still leave 75,000 pounds of gain. And well, there's your answer. That gain is eligible for entrepreneur's relief. We've owned the shares and been an employee for long enough in this trading company to be eligible, therefore, for entrepreneur's relief. Entrepreneur's relief is not restricted on a proportionate basis. Either you get it, or pardon me, either you get it or you don't get it there. This is a trading company, therefore it's eligible. But of course, that is merely the gain there that is chargeable. We've got to get the taxable gain. To get the taxable gain, we need to deduct the AEA of 12,000, bringing us down, therefore, to 63,000 pounds of taxable gain, which, as we said, for the reasons that we have stated, that will be eligible for ER and therefore will be taxed at 10%, giving us a CGT liability of something that looks like £6,300. So if you're going to see uh, a mix in terms of assets that are part trading, part not, part business, part not, it's probably going to be shares there. And there you're going to have to use that CBA over CA. The giveaway will be there is not just the value of the shares and their original cost. Here's a balance sheet showing at market values what these assets on the balance sheet were worth at the date of disposal. That therefore begs the question, do we have any investments on that balance sheet? If we do, then you've got to restrict the gain eligible for gift relief to the fraction CBA over CA. OK, that thankfully brings uh, gift relief to an end in relation to our lectures. It means we are left with just one more relief available, whereas all of the reliefs we've looked at so far have been to do with business assets. The last one that we have is nothing to do with business assets. It's in relation to your principal private residence and the type of relief you get on this non-business asset, this principal private residence of yours, is the best possible relief you could ever have. It's an exemption. The PPR relief will exempt some, the most situation in practice, all of the gain that an individual makes on the disposal of his or her or theirs, indeed, their principal private residence. What, of course, will happen in an exam question, something will happen as regards the period of ownership over which the gain has arisen on that property to tell you that not all of that gain is eligible for PPR relief. But 
all of that to finally finish off this particular chapter in our next session together.